I would like to give a quick historical introduction. So just to uh, ground us in history, uh, Chen Gapon was a chaplain during World War II. His, he was uh, Czech, of, of Czech background. So Bohemia is where his family came from. They settled in Kansas. He grew up as a Kansas farm boy uh, and was ordained a priest and during World War II became a chaplain. Served, the war ended. He went back to Kansas to the Diocese of Wichita, which is a great diocese, uh, by the way. And the bishop there sent him to Catholic University to get a master's degree in education because I think they had plans to eventually make him the superintendent of schools. He did that, he got his degree, and then he was back in Kansas working, and he just had a yearning to return to ministry with soldiers. He loved working with soldiers, and I understand that. So he asked permission, and his bishop very graciously allowed him to return to active duty chaplaincy. So uh, at the end of World War II, we had this period of a few years when everybody was exhausted from fighting and military discipline preparedness sort of shrunk down. We had some occupation forces in Japan. And in 1950, the, uh, the communists had been invading from the Soviet Union. They'd taken over China. They'd taken over North Korea. And so in 1950, the North Koreans invaded South Korea. Now, on a world map, uh, Korea is a peninsula that sticks off the east coast of China. It sort of points like a dagger right at Japan. Uh, so that's where we are in the part of the world. And if you take the peninsula of Korea and just cut it in half, you have Northern Korea and Southern Korea. So when the North Koreans attacked, uh, it was a bit of a surprise and they swept down through South Korea all the way down to the, the southernmost capital city of Pusan. As the North Koreans attacked, America realized that this was an invasion of a communist country into a free country. Uh, and so we supported South Korea and we took a lot of our forces that were in Japan and quite honestly not ready in terms of equipment and training and discipline. And we just threw them uh, in front of these advancing North Korean forces. So there was a lot of tragic uh, blood loss on our part uh, from us just not being ready, which actually should be a lesson to our country that we always we should always be ready. But uh, but Father Clapon was involved with the uh, 8th Cav Regiment uh, during this assault, and he was well known among the soldiers for just being a great chaplain. Eventually, uh, Douglas MacArthur, who was the general in charge of the amphibious, amphibious landings in the Pacific during World War II, and so he conceived this idea of doing an, an amphibious landing onto uh, the city of Incheon in Korea which would be impossible for anybody else who had not spent the last four years conducting amphibious landings in the Pacific. So we landed a bunch of uh, American forces behind the North Koreans, and now they had to retreat because we were behind them. They retreated up past the, the 38th parallel, which is the border between North and South Korea, and we continued to push them way up into Northern Korea. And from our perspective at that point, it looked like the war was won and we had just completely beat the North Koreans very quickly and uh, it was all going to end up in a matter of weeks. So when the soldiers were up there, it was approaching winter. It was already October in North Korea, up in the mountains, already getting cold. But we didn't bother to send them winter supplies because they said, another week or two, you're coming back. We were also getting word that the Chinese communists had said, if we crossed the border into North Korea, that they would enter the war. And we kind of ignored that. Um, and then the 8th Cav Regiment was way up north in Northern Korea. And we started getting intelligence reports from local North Korean farmers that the Chinese were in the hills around us. And we kind of ignored that. <laughs> we said, no, the Chinese aren't in these hills. Those are just you know, North Koreans that are running away. So on the night of November 1st, the morning of November 1st, the night of November 1st, 100,000 Chinese communists that were in the hills swarmed around the 8th Cavalry Regiment and just started devouring its battalions. So Father Capone was in the 3rd Battalion. Uh, it was the 3rd Battalion to get attacked. And so that was the, the military incident for which Father Capone ended up receiving the Medal of Honor.
he and his chaplain assistant evacuated three truckloads of soldiers south to friendly lines. And the Father Capone told his chaplain assistant, Patrick Schuler, you wait here, I'm gonna go get one more truckload, and he never returned. I don't think he ever had plans to return. When he went back to the fighting, he saved 38 more lives by pulling people out of direct fire and into just a shack, basically. And when the unit was finally surrounded and they were going to surrender, he had rescued, Father Capone had rescued a Chinese communist captain who spoke English and through him was able to arrange a surrender of the prisoners. Otherwise, the Chinese communist soldiers were just coming and shot everybody. So he saved those lives. Those were the actions for which he got his Medal of Honor eventually. The story that I'm going to tell touches on all that very quickly, but really most of the story deals with his time in the prison camp. It's written by Mike Dow, who was a West Point graduate, class of 1950. He graduated in June of 1950, October 28th. He's captured as a prisoner of war of the Chinese communists and is a prisoner for the next two and a half years. Imagine that. Became very good friends. And then when Mike was finally released, he wrote this article for the Saturday Evening Post. Mike has done many things in his life of national significance. He's an amazing man. I can't believe he calls me his friend. I don't deserve it. He's, I love the man and his family. Um, but he will say one of the most important things he's ever done in his life is write this story so people can know about Father Capone. Okay, so The Ordeal of Chaplain Capone, written by Mike Dow Jr., as told to Harold H. Martin of the Saturday Evening Post. He wore the cross of the chaplain branch instead of the crossed rifles of the infantry, but he was, I think, the best foot soldier I ever knew, and the bravest man, and the kind. His name was Emil Joseph Capon, and he was a priest of the Roman Catholic Church. But the men he served in the prison camps of Korea didn't care whether he was Catholic or Baptist, Lutheran or Presbyterian. To all of them, Catholic, Protestant, and Jew alike, and to men who professed no formal faith at all, he was simply father. And each of them, when trouble came, drew courage and hope and strength from him. He's dead now, murdered by the Red Chinese, and his body lies in an unmarked grave somewhere along the Yalu River. But the hundreds of men who knew and loved him have not forgotten him. And I write this so that the folks back home can know what kind of man he was and what he did for us and how he died. Now, the first thing I want to make clear is this. He was a priest of the church and he was a man of great piety but there was nothing soft or ethereal about him, nothing unctuous or holier than thou. He wore his piety in his heart, but outwardly, he was all GI, tough of body, rough of speech sometimes, full of the fry humor of the combat soldier. In a camp where men had to steal or starve, he was the most accomplished food thief of them all and in a prison where inmates hated their communist captors with a bone deep hate. He was the most unbending enemy of communism. And when they tried to brainwash him, he had the guts to tell them to their faces that they lied. He actually pitied the Reds for their delusions, but he preached no doctrine of turn the other cheek. I came upon him once sitting in the sunshine by the road and there was a smile on his face and a look of happiness in his eyes. I hated to break in on his meditations, but I sorely needed cheering up. So I asked him, what are you thinking about, Father? And he said, oh, I'm thinking about that happy day when the first American tank rolls down that road, and then I'm gonna catch that little so-and-so comrade's son and kick his butt right over the fence. Such plain, blunt speech was typical of him. He always spoke in phrases that even the most unlettered soldier could understand. For he himself was the son of a Kansas farmer, and he had a farmer's flair for down-to-earth, homey talk. In his religious services, which he doggedly held despite the Chinese communists' threats, his sermons were brief but deep, and every point he made struck home. Even the great mysteries of the Christian faith, which no one can truly understand, became clearer to us whenever he spoke about them. He always spoke in parallels, relating the sufferings that Christ endured to those that we were forced to bear. 
And as he spoke, the agony in the garden, the road to Calvary, the crucifixion, all became very real to us who ourselves lived daily under the threat of death and who bore our own crosses of blows and cold and illness and starvation. But Christ endured, he told us, and we too must endure, for the day of our resurrection will surely come. The re our resurrection from the tomb of this prison camp, the way the tomb, the stone was rolled away from Christ's sepulcher. And because of these sermons, which gave us hope and courage, and because of the food and medicine that he stole for us, and because of the care he gave us when we were sick, many of us came back who never would have survived our long ordeal without him. He had become a legend among the troops long before the Chinese captured him, when his outfit, the 8th Cavalry Regiment of the 1st Cav Division, was fighting along the Naktang. His jeep was blown up by enemy fire, and his driver was wounded. So he commandeered a ramshackle bicycle, and with his helmet jammed down over his ears, his pockets stuffed with apples and peaches that he had scrounged from Korean orchards, he'd ride this bone-shaking bicycle all over the pot-filled rocky roads and paths through the paddy fields until he came to a forward outpost. There, he'd drop into a shallow hole next to a nervous rifleman. He would crack a joke or two, offer him a peach or an apple, say a prayer for him, and then he'd be moving on to the next position. He always stayed close to the fighting, even before the blood had dried on the dusty slopes after the calf had taken a hill. He'd set up his altar on a litter stretched across ammunition boxes. And there, <clears throat> on the battlefield with mortar fire coming in and the enemy massing for a counterattack in sight, he'd hear confessions and celebrate the mass and administer Holy Communion to men who in another hour would once again be fighting for their lives. His parish was the front lines of battle and the battalion aid station right behind those front lines. There, he would cheer the wounded as best he could. The, um, he'd joke and kid with the lightly wounded and over the dying men, whatever their faith, he'd offer the last prayers of the church. He seemed to have no fear that he himself might be killed. At Kumchan, early in the war, when word came back that there was a wounded man in a position so exposed that our littermen could not reach him, Father and another man on the left flank of the 1st Battalion, an officer, went after him and brought that man back, crawling and ducking from rock to rock through fires so thick that his pipe was shot out of his mouth. And for that particular action, he received a bronze star with V device. It was his devotion to the wounded which finally cost him both his freedom and his life. It was at Unsan on the 2nd of November in 1950. For 36 hours, the 8th Cavalry had been fighting a perimeter defense and they beat off a fanatical attack. Early in the morning, a breakthrough came and all day, hand-to-hand -hand fighting swirled around the command post and in the battalion aid stations where wounded were being cared for. Finally, at dusk, the order came for every man who could still walk to attempt to break out through the surrounding enemy and make their way south back to friendly lines. Father, who was unwounded, might have escaped with them. He refused to go. Of his own free will, he stayed on, helping Captain Clarence L. Anderson, the regimental surgeon, take care of the wounded. And there, just at dark, the Chinese took him as he said the last prayers over a dying man. I'll never forget that night that I finally met him. It was at Piak Tong on a backwater of the Yalu River, a village where prisoners from many American units were being assembled. With the survivors of my outfit, Charlie Company of the 19th Infantry of the 24th Division, I had been brought there from near Anjou, where we had been overrun. The men of the 8th Cavalry, who had broken out of the perimeter and had later been captured by twos and threes as they scattered to the south, were already there. As we came in, they crowded around us and asked for word of Father Capon, but we had none. That afternoon, Piak Tang was bombed. A B-26 swept over, dropping firebombs, and more than half the city uh, went up in flames. The Chinese panicked. They broke all the prisoners out of their houses and shooting at the feet of the walking wounded to hurry them along, they herded us up a hill, up out of the town. All that afternoon and into the night, we sat there on the icy slope, cold and miserable, smoking cigarettes made out of dried oak leaves and watching the burning town. That night, they brought us down to 
where the wounded from another group lay along the road on litters made out of straw sacks stretched on rough pine poles. Where we shouldered the stretchers and set out over a frozen road to the southwest. Now I was on the right hand pole at the front and we carried them up on our shoulders and as our shoulders began to ache with the pressure of the pole against the muscle, we'd stop and change positions. So it was during one of these breaks that I noticed the man who was carrying behind me. He was a short man with thick, shoulder, with, uh, with thick shoulder with a wide set of gray eyes and a strong jaw with a deep cleft in it. He wore a thin red brown beard with a little tuft of goat whiskers at the chin. I'm Mike Dow, I said. Capone, he said, putting out his hand. Father, I said, feeling as if I'd met a long lost friend. I've heard about you. And he smiled and lowered his voice and said, well, don't pass it along because my bishop doesn't know I'm here. And if he finds out, he'll be pissed. It was a feeble joke, but considering our circumstances, it cheered us all up. Hour after hour, we stumbled on. Now, it was hard enough to walk by yourself on that dark, rocky, ice-covered road where, where footing was slippery and treacherous, but carrying a litter was agony. The Chinese, when they first captured us, said, you are no longer soldiers. You do not listen to your officers and your sergeants. You listen only to us. You leave these men here and march that way. Some of our soldiers, out of fear or confusion, actually listened. And whenever we, re we refused to carry one of our wounded, that man was certain to freeze to death, or much more commonly, a communist guard would just drop to the back of the line as we were marching north. He would disappear out of sight, we would hear gunshots, and he would catch up with us. Some of our officers at NCOs tried to, make, tried to order men to carry the stretchers. That never worked. Father never ordered a man to carry. After arrest, he just called, let's pick him up, boys. And all down the line, men would lift and carry and follow his example. Because in the 60 to 80 miles that we marched northward to the prison camp we were being brought to, I never once saw father take a break from carrying someone. Far in the night, we came to a village of huts scattered along a narrow valley. The Chinese communists went ahead of us, driving the people out of their own houses. We dropped all the wounded off at one house, and the rest of us were moved on to the other houses farther up the valley. Father and Doc Anderson refused to leave the wounded, but the Chinese threatened them and made them move on with the rest of us. The next morning, they came around and pulled all the officers out and put us together in a compound at the north end of the valley. Father squawked about being separated from his enlisted men, but the Chinese just poked him with gun butts and made him move along. In the first week of our stay in the Valley of the Chinese, the Chinese allowed us a food ration of 500 grams of millet, which is basically bird seed, 500 grams per day. It was a starvation ration to begin with, and then they cut it down to 450 grams. It was obvious, Father said, that we must eat steel food or slowly starve. And in that dangerous enterprise, we must have the help of some power beyond ourselves. So, standing before us all, he said a prayer to St. Dismith, Dismas, the good thief crucified at the right hand of Jesus, asking for his aid. I will never doubt the power of prayer again, because Father, it seemed, could not fail. At the risk of being shot by the guards, he'd sneak at night into the little fields around the compound and prowl through the shocked corn and find where the Koreans had hidden potatoes and grain beneath the corn shocks. He moved out of the crowded room where 19 of us slept spoon fashion in a desperate attempt to use our own body heat to keep ourselves from freezing to death. He moved out of that warm situation to sleep in an open shed in the compound because he found that that shed backed up to a crib full of Korean corn which he surreptitiously stole for us ear by ear. His riskiest thefts were carried out by daylight right under the noses of the Chinese. We POWs cooked our own food, which was drawn uh, from an open supply shed some two miles down the valley. When men were called out to make the ration run, father would slip in at the end of the line. And before the ration detail reached the supply shed, he'd slide off into the bushes and creeping and crawling, he'd come up behind the supply shed. And then when the rest of us started a commotion amongst ourselves or sometimes with the Chinese guards, he would sneak into the supply shed, snatch up a sack of cracked corn and scurry off back into the bushes. 
there were other men stealing too, and some of them squirreled away their stolen food to eat later by themselves. But father always took his rations and tossed it into the common pot. He never said a word directly to the men who were stealing for themselves, but at night, after a successful foray, he'd say a prayer of thanks to God for providing food which we can all equally share. Well, that seemed to shame them, and soon the private hoarding stopped. Father knew that was essential to stop them from that because the selfishness of that would break up the union of the team in prison. His one great failure had overtones of humor which served to relieve what at that time was a dark tragedy. Once, after we'd been moved back to Pyaktan, a little black pig wandered into the compound and men who had tasted no meat in months felt themselves drooling as father, a big rock in hand, cautiously stalked the little pig. And while dozens of silent prayers went up from every corner of the camp, he brought the rock up high and he brought it down. He struck the pig, but it was only a glancing blow and the pig set up a horrible squealing and went running down the road. A Chinese guard came running out of the guard shed, slamming a magazine into his rifle saying, huh, huh, huh? Father ran for the latrine and the Chinese guard in confusion ran off in hot pursuit of the little black pig. And so father got away with that one that day. Soon after we reached the valley, the wounded in the sick house, and only the Chinese had the audacity to call it a hospital, our wounded began to die by the dozens, poisoned by their untended wounds. Finally, the Chinese allowed Doc Anderson to go to their aid, although at that point, he had nothing but the skill of his hands to help them. Encouraged by this concession, father asked permission to go along with the doc. That permission was refused. What these men need is medicine, not prayers, the Chinese communists told him. Well, since they aren't getting any medicine, a little prayer's not going to hurt them, is it? No, the Chinese told him, you will not be permitted to spread your poisonous Christian propaganda here. And so then began father's most hazardous exploits. On days when there was a ration run, he'd stop and steal food at the warehouse. And then with his pockets full of cracked corn or millet, dodging the Chinese roving patrols that were watching the trails, he moved to the house where the wounded were. On the days when there was no ration run or wood carrying detail, he would just sneak down there, ducking under the bushes to keep out of the sight of the guards who would have shot him for being out of the barracks. He scrounged cotton undershirts and he cut them up and he turned them into bandages. Um, he would take men's bandages that were, fat, that were foul with the corruption and sneak them down to the river, wash them, dry them, and bring them back to the men. He picked lice from their bodies, an inestimable service because a man so weak that he cannot pick his own lice would be bled to death by the insects in about three days. He let men smoke his pipe loaded with dry cotton leaves and he joked with them and he said prayers for them. And he held them in his arms like children as delirium came upon them. But the main thing he did for them was to put into their hearts the will to live. For when you are wounded and sick and starving, it's easy to give up and quietly die. Somehow, as it says in the New Testament, power went forth from him and healed them. In Father Capon's Valley, the conditions were actually much worse than in the camp which came to be known as Death Valley. But in Death Valley, where people actually cooperated more with their, their communist captors, in Death Valley, the death rate was 10 times higher. But even when men died, he did not abandon them. POWs buried their own dead carrying the bodies of the adjacent mountainside and later in Pyaktang across the frozen Yalu backwater to a little island where they dug the graves in the stony frozen ground. Men dodged burial detail whenever they could, but father always volunteered. And as the grave, and at the grave as the earth covered the naked body, for the clothing of the dead was always saved to warm the bodies of the living he would utter for them the last great plea of the church, eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. When he had done all he could at the houses of the wounded, he would slip out 
to the houses where the enlisted men were kept. And it would step in quickly and quietly saying, the Lord be with you. And the starving, torpid men lying on straw mats would sit up and respond as he had taught them, and with thy spirit. And then he would say a quick general service, beginning with a prayer for the men who had died in Korea, both in battle and in prison. And then he would pray for the sick and the wounded and for the folks back home. And then he would say a prayer of thanks to God for the favors that God had granted us, whether we knew about them or not. He would thank him for the food and the wood and the water we have received even at the hands of our enemies. And then he'd speak very briefly, a short, simple sermon, urging them to hold on and not lose hope of freedom. And above all, he urged them not to fall for the lying communist doctrines the Reds were trying to pound into our heads. Be not afraid of them who kill the body, he'd say, quoting from the scriptures. Rather fear ye him who after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Because the father's stubborn faith, the man who bought communist teachings, and the very small group did, out of ignorance or opportunism, was selling his immortal soul. In his soiled and ragged fatigues, with his scraggly beard, and a queer woolen cap made out of the sleeve of an old GI sweater pulled down over his ears, he looked like any other half-starved prisoner. But there was something in his voice and bearing that was different. Dignity, composure, serenity that radiated from him like light. Wherever he stood was holy ground and the spirit of Christ within him, a spirit of reverence and abiding faith, went out to the silent listening men and gave them hope and courage and a sense of peace. By his very presence, somehow he could turn a stinking, louse-ridden mud hut into a glorious cathedral. He did thousands of little things to keep us going. He gathered and washed the foul undergarments of the dead, and distributed them to men so weak from dysentery that they could not move. And he washed and tended these men as if they were little babies. He traded his watch, a gift to him from his mother on his ordination day when he became a priest. He traded it from, for a wool blanket from the camp commander. He explained to the camp commander that not only was it a good watch, but it was important to him. And the camp commander took the opportunity to mock Father Capone Oh, how much you must love your mother to part so easily with such a precious gift. Here, take the blanket. Much good may it do you. Father Capone took the abuse and he took the blanket and then he cut that blanket up to make dozens of pairs of woolen socks for the feet of men who were freezing. One day in the freezing wind with a sharp stick and his bare hands as his only tools that he cut steps into the steep ice-covered path that led down to the stream uh, so that men carrying water on water detail would not fall and hurt themselves. Because at that point, the men were so weak and sick that even a bruise could become a life-threatening disease. The most dreaded housekeeping chore of all was cleaning the latrines. And men argued bitterly over whose turn it was to carry out that loathsome task. And as men argued amongst themselves, he would just slip out and do the job himself. In mid-January, in sub-zero cold, they marched just eight miles back to Pyaktang into houses still shattered by the bombing and the fire. Nine of our sick and wounded died that day, and many of the rest of us, sick, half-starved, and despairing, were on the point of giving up. But Father let scrounging parties out to prowl through the ruins, to find nails and tin and broken boards to patch the houses and to make them at least somewhat livable. In the yard of the officer's compound, he built a little fireplace with bricks that he had stolen. On it, with wood that he had stolen. In fact, once the communists caught him stealing pickets from a fence and they made him stand for hours, stripped of his clothing, on ice, hoping that the exposure to the cold would kill him. With that wood, he would heat water in pans made from tin that he had stolen and pound it into the shape of the rock that he didn't have to steal. But every morning, he'd bring in this pan full of hot water, calling cheerfully, coffee, everybody, 
and he'd pour a little bit of hot water into each man's bowl. And though there was no coffee in it, somehow that sip of hot water in the morning gave each man heart to rise and pick off his lice and choke down his bowl of soupy millet and face, if not with cheerfulness, then at least without despair, another day of captivity and abuse. He was always telling us we'd be free and he was always dreaming up fancy menus, 10 course meals we'd eat when we got home. He, we all did it, but he was the best at describing them. At night, we'd hear the roar and see the flash of great explosions to the south. Those were actually our bombers that were working over the roads and bridges on the communist supply route to the front. But we thought it was our, our artillery. The guns sound closer tonight, father would say. They're coming. They'll be here soon enough. See how the moon is full tonight? By the next time the moon is full, we'll be free. Well, as weeks and months passed, robbed of all strength by diseases such as pellagra and beriberi, men grew weaker. The unbroken diet of millet and corn became nauseating. We could barely choke it down. By mid-March, we, we were in such desperate condition that we were boiling green weeds in our hunts to get any vitamins at all into our diet. The hideous swelling of the body that is the first mark of approaching death by starvation was showing up on more and more of us. The night before St. Patrick's Day, Father called us all together and prayed to St. Patrick, asking him to help us in our misery. And the next day, the Chinese brought us a case of liver, the first meat that we had had, and they issued us goldion instead of millet. Well, the liver was spoiled, and goldion is sorghum seed used as cattle feed in the United States, but to us at that time, they were like manna from heaven. Later, he prayed for tobacco, and that night, a guard walked by and for some unknown reason, tossed a little bag of dry, straw-like Korean tobacco into our room. As our bodies weakened, the Reds stepped up the pace of their propaganda assaults on our minds. Hour after hour, we had to sit in lectures with Comrade Sun, a fanatic little Chinese communist who hated Americans with a bone deep hatred. And he assailed our rotten capitalistic Wall Street civilization. And then we would have to comment upon the great truths revealed to us by Comrade Sun. Well, a few bold men in reckless despair said in unprintable words exactly what they thought of those truths that were revealed to us. Those men, were thrown into a freezing hole or subjected to other tortures, sometimes resulting in their deaths. Some would veil ridicule. Well, according to the great doctrines revealed to us by Stalin, Lenin, Marx, and Engels, and Abbott and Costello, and then they would read aloud in the classes. Father was neither openly arrogant, nor did he use subterfuge. Without ever losing his temper or raising his voice, he'd answer the lecturer point by point with a calm logic that would set Conrad's son screaming and leaping on the platform like an ape. They never punished him, except by threats and ominous warnings. Now, two officers, who knew him, two officers who knew him well, they were taken away and tortured. With their hands tied behind their back, they were lifted by ropes until their wrists pulled apart. They were then taken inside to sign false confessions, uh, charging Father Capone with different things. And then they brought them back in to accuse him publicly. They charged him with slandering the Chinese, which was true, if you call telling the truth about them slander, which the Chinese did. Uh, they said that he advocated resistance to the communist study program and that he displayed a hostile attitude toward his captors. That was also true. They said that he threatened them with court martial if they went along with the Chinese, which was not true. Father never threatened anybody. In fact, when those two men were returned to the barracks, quite unsure of how they would be received by the rest of us, father made a point of being the one to greet them at the door. And looking at their twisted, rope-burned hands, he said, you never should have suffered one moment trying to protect me. Well, we expected at that point that the public accusation would bring on a farcical trial in which father would be take, convicted and taken out and never returned. Instead, they merely called him in bullied him and threatened him. And we realized at that point, something that we had half known all along. They were afraid of him. They recognized in him a strength they could not break.
a spirit they could not quell, something they could not get their hands on. And above all things, they feared a mass rebellion because they knew that a father was maltreated, the whole camp of 4,000 men were mutiny. And so on Easter Sunday, 1951, he hurled at them his boldest challenge, openly flouting their law against religious services. In the yard of a burnt out church in the officer's compound, just at sunrise, he read the Easter service. He could not celebrate the mass because all of his mass equipment had been lost at the time of his capture. All he had was the things he used when he administered the last rites to the dying. The purple ribbon called a stole, which he wore around his neck as a badge of his priesthood, and the gold ciborium, now empty, in which the host had been carried when he had administered Holy Communion, and the little bottles of holy oils used to administer the last sacraments. But he fashioned a cross out of two rough pieces of wood, and from a borrowed missile, he read the stations of the cross to the scarecrow men sitting on the rubbled steps of the burnt-out church. And he told the story of Christ's suffering and death. And then, holding in his hands a rosary made from bent barbed wire cut from the prison fence, he recited the glorious mysteries of Christ, risen from the tomb and ascended into heaven. As we watched him, it became clear to us that Father himself had at last begun to fail. On the starvation diet we were allowed, a man could not afford to miss a single day's meals without growing too weak. And for months, Father had been sharing his own meager rations with sick and dying men. The week after Easter, he began to limp, hobbling along on a crooked stick. And then the next Sunday, as he read the service for the first Sunday after Easter, as he reached the line in the epistle, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith, his voice faltered, and we caught him as he fell. Beneath his tattered uniform, his right leg was dreadfully swollen and discolored. For weeks, we knew he had been suffering terrible bone aches, a byproduct of hunger that comes upon men with such fearful force that they would scream and beat the ground in agony. Father, when awake, never even whimpered. But when he slept, his iron will would break like the rest of us, and he would moan pitifully. Finally, the bad pain went away, but the leg continued to swell until it was one great mass of purple, blue, and yellow flesh. The communist doctor, a brainwasher posing as a medical man, pronounced the usual diagnosis by which they sought to convince us, or at least to convince themselves, that we truly were an evil, immoral, and decaying race. Father, he said, has syphilis. Well, Doc Anderson knew it for what it was. It was a blood clot in his leg blocking circulation. And so, using the bricks that Father had stolen to make the fireplace, to boil water, to cheer our hearts, and also to help us with our dysentery, we warmed those bricks and applied them as hot packs. And slowly, the swelling began to subside. Soon, Father could walk again, although he was so weak and shaky that he would often fall. And then a fearful dysentery seized him. And as he had so often done for us, we cared for him as best we could. And he beat that, and he got on his feet again. And then one raw, cold day, he arose, a walking ghost, to give the last sacraments to a dying man. The next day, his eyes were bright with fever, and his breath came in a hoarse rattle. He had taken pneumonia, and soon was in delirium. Thinking back upon it, I believe that period of semi-consciousness might have been the only happy time he knew during his captivity. Around him, there seemed to gather all the people he had known in his boyhood, on the farm in Kansas, and in his school days. Babbling happily, sometimes laughing, he spoke to his mother and his father, and to the priests he'd known in seminary. Even in his delirium, his unbreakable spirit manifested itself in sallies of humor. But finally, fearfully, he sank into a deep and quiet sleep. And then he awoke. He had broken through, he was lucid, he was completely rational. The crisis had passed, he was getting well. But the Chinese did not intend that he should survive. He was sitting up, eating and cracking jokes, 
when the communist guards came with a litter to take him to the hospital. We knew then that he was doomed because the hospital was no hospital at all, but a death house so dreadful that I will make no attempt to describe it here. In the room in which he was placed, men in their last extremes were left to lie there untended in their own filth and freezing cold until death mercifully took them. Our doctors protested violently against his being taken, but the Chinese cursed them and forbade them to go along to help him. The rest of us protested, but all they answered was, he goes, he goes. A fight started to break out between us and the Chinese guards and father sat up and with a surprising loud voice, begged us all to stop because he was afraid we would get injured defending him. He himself made no protest. He looked around the room at all of us standing there and he smiled. He held in his hands the ciborium, the little gold cup in which long ago he had carried the bread of life. And he said, tell them back home that I died a happy death. And he smiled again. As they loaded him on the litter, he turned to Lieutenant Nardella from, whom, from whose missile he had read the services. And he put the little book in Nardella's hands and he said, you know the prayers, Ralph. You keep holding services. Don't let them make you stop. And then he turned to another officer who before his capture had been having trouble back home. And he said to him, when you get back to Jersey, you get that marriage of yours straightened out or I'll come down from heaven and kick you in the butt. And then he turned to me and he said, don't take it hard, Mike. I'm going where I've always wanted to go. And when I get there, I'll pray for all of you. Well, despite his guidance, I stood there crying unashamed. As they took him down the road, the little gold cup still shining in his hands. Beside me stood Fezi Gergen, a Turkish lieutenant, a Muslim, who said, to Allah, who is my God, I will pray for him. And a few days later, he was dead. We were the ones that had to carry him up the hill to the death house. Our soldiers reported to us that as they carried him, he asked God's forgiveness for the Chinese guards who were escorting us. When he got to the door of the death house, Comrade's son was waiting for him to mock him. As they brought him through, he reached out and grabbed his arm and asked his forgiveness for his ill thoughts of him during his time of captivity. Not long afterward, the little daughter of the Chinese camp commander walked past the compound, tossing up and down something that glittered in the sun. It was father's little gold cup. And on the demands of the POWs, it was returned to us at Operation Big Switch, the prisoner exchange at the end of the war. And we brought it back to commemorate father's deeds and the deeds of all who died at the hands of the communists. It is to be placed as a memorial in his hometown of Pilsen, which it was, and then was moved to Capon High School in Wichita. That's where it is today. A year later, on the anniversary of his death, Ralph Nardella asked permission from the communists to hold a service in father's memory. They refused. And you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad they refused. Because it told me that even though he was dead, his body lost forever in a mass grave, they were still afraid of him. They feared him because he was the symbol of something they knew they could not kill. The unconquerable spirit whose body was made free by his country and so his soul was made free by his God to whom he owed his final allegiance. And in that sense, I know that he and the things he believed in can never die. Almighty God, thank you for all those who fight for our freedom, who fight in the military, who fight in our political system, who fight in our church for one of the great gifts you give us. You made us free. 
thank you for the men who died in prison camps and who survived and came home and for the sacrifices they made. Thank you for Mike Dow, that he was able to write this and share the story with us. And thank you for what you did in and through Father Capon. He inspires us. And I firmly believe, God, that he is in heaven, assisting us with his prayers. And I would pray, God, that you would let him be recognized as a saint throughout the world for your glory. Amen. Thank you for letting me tell that story. I love sharing it. I love letting people know about it. I want people to become friends with Father Capon. He's one of my heroes.